So welcome everyone to the last talk of section 13, combinatorics. Except that this talk is joined with section 12, probability and statistics. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the speaker, uh, Richard Kenyon. Richard Kenyon is the William R. Kennan University Professor of Mathematics at uh, Brown University. He got his PhD in 1990 at Princeton with Bill Thurston. Let me just mention uh, one thing about uh, one of his awards. And uh, so he, in 2007, got the Loew Prize, uh, most prestigious prize in probability. So, Richard. Thank you. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a great honor to be here, and uh, I would like to thank, uh, thank you for staying. I know it's been a long day. Um, uh, rather than uh, give a give a survey of my area, I thought I would talk about what's currently interesting to me. And but I will give some background and some older work. Uh, and I hope that you, uh, if you're new to this area, get a, at least get a feel for the kind of problems which we're interested in from this presentation. So um, my work, my presentation is going to be based on work which I've been doing for many years now with a number of co-authors. Among them are a few listed here, Henry Cohn, Jim Propp, Andre Okunkov, Scott Sheffield, and the most recent work is with, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in the second half at least, is Yanda here and Sam Watson. Okay, so, um, Here's a very simple uh, thing. You, you take a, 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 a closed wire frame, you bend your coat hanger, <laughs> dip it into your soap film, uh, and out, when, you, when you pull it out, out comes this beautiful mathematical, mathematical object, this uh, minimal surface. Uh, what's a minimal surface? It's, a, you know, the film, soap film contracts and it tries to uh, minimize the area, but it's, of course, pinned to the boundary. And uh, that that's a, kind, of, kind of makes a nice bent surface. And I think this is one of the few places in nature where you can actually see uh, an analytic function, un try to understand what an analytic function is. You can show your students, you know, when you're teaching complex analysis, you know, there you see, uh, you know, this curvy thing is described by an analytic function. And in fact, there's a beautiful parameterization of minimal surfaces uh, due to Weierstrass and Enneper here. Uh, it's a little bit cut off, but you, you, I can use the pointer. Uh, you take your two favorite uh, complex analytic functions, f and g, and you form these three integrals, just antiderivatives. Uh, you take the real part, and those form the three coordinates, x, y, and z coordinates of this surface as the, as the complex variable uh, varies. So it's a nice uh, parameterization of this, of any soap film using a pair of complex analytic functions. And uh, uh, well, of course, one of, the, one of the problems which remains is how do, you, how do you match the boundary conditions with the functions? If I give you the wire frame, like this particular one, and I ask what is f and g, uh, this is a, a hard problem which many people, uh, uh, I mean, there's no, there's no easy to solution to that particular version, matching the boundary conditions with the correct uh, analytic functions. So that's going to come back. So I, I want, but I'm not going to talk about uh, soap film surfaces in this chalk. I'm going to talk about some combinatorial object, which, which are also minimal surfaces in a certain sense. Uh, so let's think about the. Uh, these are called Lawson's tilings. So it's a, you can you you can think about it two ways as a two-dimensional object. It's just a tiling of, a, of a, some region in the plane with these three tiles, the 60 degree run by yellow, blue, and pink. Uh, but, if, but if you think about it as a three-dimensional object, you can think about this uh, boundary as some sort of wireframe in three, three dimensions. And uh, uh, if, I, if I'm looking for a surface which spans that wireframe and is composed of the squares from the cubic lattice, unit squares from the cubic lattice, as you see, uh, and is minimal in the sense of minimizing the, the area, then you know, this is one possible solution. And of course, there are many possible sol solutions. Each solution corresponds to a tiling when you project to the, 
the to the plane to the appropriate plane. And you know, well, uh, maybe I, 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 I thought I should say at least one or two things about why uh, we care about this. I mean, after all, uh, f for some motivational purposes, uh, one of the uh, cool things about this particular. Uh, if you if you count the number of solutions for this particular boundary, this hexagonal boundary, there's kind of an amazing well, okay, <laughs> formula, you know, which is 100 100 years old. Percy McMahon uh, showed that this that there's a very simple formula uh, for counting, which is just a you know product of ratios of uh, i plus j plus k minus one on the numerator minus two in the denominator over over the boxes. That's, fr from a combinatorial viewpoint, I think that's already sufficient motivation to try to study such an object, but uh, I think uh, there are many other motivations. <laughs> Which I won't, maybe I won't say any more, but um, Lawson's challenge, like, like the, so bubble surface from the first slide, so the, these, these lozenge tilings also satisfy a certain variational principle which I wanted to explain. Uh, and in, in what sense do they set, what is the variational principle? Well, if be, there are many solutions, there are many possible surfaces for this particular shape, for this particular boundary. And if I pick one at random, uh, the, the theorem that I want to expose is that uh, uh, the random one will actually uh, lie close to a certain non-random surface. And, and here there's a simulation on the next slide. So what I, what I did was I take n large here, n is like uh, 50 or so, 60, and I, I turned the surface on a side so you can see that there's some two-dimensional cur curvy interface here. And it's a line close to the, the kind of remarkable fact is that as n increases the random surface, the uniform random surface, that is you take the, you know, the, you take all possible surfaces spanning this frame, and you know, there are some which are very, which lie very far away, but almost all of them, with probably 10 to 1 as, as the mesh goes to zero, uh, the surface will lie within epsilon of a certain actually smooth surface spanning this particular wireframe. So it's kind of a, it seems, it seems contradictory because as n gets large, there are more and more surfaces, you know, and I'm telling you that in fact, uh, all the surfaces are getting closer and closer to a particular uh, uh, non-random limit. But this is the sort of a, sort of a law of large numbers or concentration of measure phenomenon. The surfaces still fluctuate, but the fluctuations are on a lower, lower order lower scale than the scale of n. The fluctuations are typically only of order log n uh, away from this particular non-random shape. And so this is the, the lozenge tiling limit shape theorem. And the, uh, the original theorem, which I just explained in words, is due to you know, Henry Cohn, Jim Propp, and myself uh, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and well, okay, I didn't write the part of the theorem which says there is a limit shape, but the, the relevant part for this, for, for, I mean, the second part of the theorem is that the, you can actually describe the limit shape, the, the limiting surface, uh, as, as a min minimizer of a certain uh, functional equation. Uh, uh, and, and well, so you, if you write the surface as a graph, you can write the surface as a graph of a function h on the, on the two-dimensional region here. So the surface, you think of the surface, you know, the, the, the plane is the sort of plane x plus y plus z equals zero. You, you think of the surface as a, as a graph of a function on that plane, h. And then h, the, the limiting surface, you know, you, you, you fix the region, you let the mesh size go to zero, and you look at this non-random limiting surface, that minimum surface will satisfy a certain, uh, the, will minimize the following in, uh, an integral. Uh, you inter integrate this area integral over the region of a certain function, sigma, uh, called the surface tension function. And sigma is, a, in fact, as a function only of the gradient of H. And uh, well, what this is, should, this is in an, an analogy with the previous, 
the soap film surface, which also satisfies a variational principle, it minimizes the area. In that case, the, the surface tension is the area integral. Uh, here, the surface tension is, is not the area, it's minimizing some, some other function. Well, uh, sigma is a, is a but it, it, again, it only depends on the slope, just like the soap film, but the, the dependence is more, more, more complicated. And so, <laughs> What, what function is sigma? Well, it's a function of the, of the gradient or the slope, and uh, how should we think about sigma? Well, if we, sorry, maybe let's go back. If I zoom in, if, imagine a very f fine mesh, and I zoom into a point there, what I'm gonna see is a surface which is roughly uh, planar with some small fluctuations, and if I, uh, if I sort of blow up, such a situation, I'm going, to, I'm going to see a, a certain density of tiles of each type. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, sorry, the colors are changed from the previous slide, but let's say that there's red, green, and blue tiles, and let's call S the density of green that you see uh, in a patch, and T the density of blue, and, and the, of course, 1 minus S minus T is the density of the red, the, um, and the, these three numbers, S, T, and 1 minus S minus T, those, those control the, the slope of the surface. Right? The gradient is just a function of S and T. Right? If, I got, if I got lots of red, then the surface is nearly uh, you know, parallel to the red axis, the red coordinate plane. So, and, and, uh, so for each possible pair of densities, S and T, and 1 minus S minus T, there's an associated uh, growth rate, which is just how many surfaces have that particular average slope. Uh, by, what, by which I mean, if you take a large uh, chunk uh, with, with, with boundary conditions which approximate the correct slope, and you just count the number of tilings, you will find that the number of tilings is roughly e to the area times some constant, minus sigma. Here, sigma is the surface tension, so uh, the, the, it's, a, it's a negative number, so minus sigma is the positive number, which is the exponential growth rate, or if you like, it's the entropy. So that, that's the origin of this function sigma. It counts how many surfaces there are of a particular slope. And that's, that's what goes into the formula there. But one one uh, interesting feature of this, this model is that uh, uh, when you solve this equation, you've, you, uh, you, get, you don't get an analytic solution. The solution is only sort of piecewise analytic. And you can see that in this figure near the corners of the figure. The, 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 you only see one, one color, one color of tile. That means all the tiles are aligned near the corners. And in fact, there's a, you can see this yellow curve is, a, is, is supposed to depict the boundary between the faceted regions and the, you know, region in the middle, and that, the, the kind of the r remarkable thing about this, these particular boundary conditions is that, 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 that boundary curve is always an algebraic plane curve. In this case, it's just a cardioid. <coughs> so we'll see, the, we'll see an analog of that later. Okay, well here's a plot of the surface tension. The, the, this particular model, the lawson tiling model, can be uh, can be solved, was solved in the 60s by Castellane using determinantal methods. And if you apply those determinants uh, to, and well, <clears throat> you, you can, uh, th there is, there's exact solutions to this model. You can compute the, the surface tension sigma. Uh, and uh, r rather than the, the, quick, the, the, the quickest way to get sigma is rather than fix S and T in advance, uh, instead you should put some weights on the tiles. So if I weight the, the what, what colors were they? Blue, green, and red tiles. If I weight them by one and then e, two positive numbers, e to the x and e to the y, so that, you know, say the red has weight one and the blue has eight weight e to, the, e to the x and the green has weight e to the y, then uh, as X and Y vary, the, the, as a function of X and Y, it'll pick out the, the maximal entropy w will occur on a particular slope. So the, these two variables, X and Y, are different ways to parameterize the same space 
of slopes. Uh, you know, if, you, if you give me an x and y, I can, I can use that, those weights to, do, to define the measure on the space of tilings, and I will get a particular slopes. So if you, if you like, uh, the free energy is just the total weight of tilings where you give each tile a weight, uh, one, of these, one of these three weights, in, in a large uh, region. And the, this uh, surface tension is the Legendre dual of the free energy. So w once we get the free energy, we can just take the Legendre dual to get the sigma. All right. Um, <clears throat> the formula for this sigma is, is, is a little bit non-trivial, but it, it, uh, it has this kind of cute uh, explanation, or not explanation, but at least a derivation, not even derivation. <laughs> derivation is the wrong word. It has a cute property that uh, uh, is related to a, a Euclidean triangle. So if I take a triangle in the, in the plane with vertices 0, 1, and z, z is just a complex number, and uh, if, if I, the angles are pi s and pi t. Or rather, you know, maybe I should say, if you hand me a pair s and t, which are the densities, the desired densities, I can find a point z such that these two angles are pi s and pi t. And the, a unique point in the upper half plane. And then if the edge lengths here are going to be e to the x and e to the y. So that defines x and y as a function of s and t. Right? Or conversely, it defines s and t as a function of x and y. If you give me x and y, I can make this triangle and determine what s and t. So there's this nice you know, one-to-one -one relation between pairs s, t, and, and pairs x, y. And in fact, uh, I, uh, if, I, uh, if I move z around, then the, x, the, the t derivative of x equals the y derivative of s. This is a, it's kind of a non-trivial fact. I mean, it, it's trivial in the sense that it's just trigonometry. It's non-trivial in the sense that I don't really understand. I don't have a conceptual understanding of it. I could do the calculation, but I don't know, you know, what what it really means. Uh, but what, what, in particular, this this from this fact, you you find that there's a function sigma whose s derivative is x and whose t derivative is y, and that's the sigma we want. Turns out that's the sigma we want. Uh, if you're a if you like number theory, uh, then you can also write sigma as uh, a function of this third, uh, third, th this complex point z, and it's called the block wigner dial algorithm. It's a variant of the usual dial algorithm Li, which is the you know, sum of z to the k over k squared, uh, with some arguments and logs in front. So yes, from this, from this. Slide. You can you can recon, you can draw that picture now on with your computer. And uh, maybe I should say one, one or two more things about this picture. The 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 it's a con concave function. In fact, it's a analytic, real analytic. It's concave. It's got a minimum at this the most symmetric point, which is one third, one third, one third. That's the that's the point where the three densities of the tiles are equal to each other, which, which is the point of largest entropy. If you like entropy, you can think of the entropy as like minus sigma. I mean, it is minus sigma. And also, when, the, when you go to the boundary of the triangle, sigma, sigma is, it tends to zero. The, the, the growth rate of the number of tilings goes to zero on the boundary. So the, the, the slope the slope of the surfaces we're considering is, is always restricted to this triangle here. They live in, a, in this simplex. OK, well, um, the, the remarkable thing about this lozenge tiling model is that uh, not only can we formulate this variational principle, we can actually solve the, the, the equations just like Weierstrass and Enneper did for the minimal surface. So you, you, know, you write down this Euler-Lagrange equation, it's kind of a messy thing. Uh, 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 if you rewrite it in terms of x, the, these, these other variables, x and y, uh, remember sigma depends on s and t, but if you rewrite it in terms of x and y, it looks much simpler, uh, but it's still, uh, somewhat complicated to work with, but if you combine that with the 
equation for the mixed partials of the height function, remember that, if you remember that s is the x derivative and t is the y derivative of, of the height function, you, there's, there's a supplementary equation here. And if you combine those two equations into a single equation, you get a single equation for that variable z, z. z, uh, z, is, z is the apex point there. So it turns out, in the, at the end of the day, that uh, writing everything in terms of this variable z is the correct thing to do, right? The complex coordinate is somehow reigning supreme, just like in the, 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 minimal, the soap bubble surfaces, soap bubble minimal surfaces, the, the complex coordinate z was the, was the correct way to write the equation. Okay, so you write it in terms of z and you get this uh, still not completely trivial equation. Here, here I, I use w as 1 minus z for, for reasons that will maybe appear later in the talk. But uh, here's the equation. It's some version of, of a well-known equation called the complex Burgers equation, which also occurs in random matrix theory uh, and uh, uh, other places, you know, free probability and so on. Uh, and uh, these slides are not the most up-to-date slides, but uh, this equation is a first order PDE, you can, you can solve it by a method of characteristics, and the, you can parameterize solutions by analytic functions. Here, here this, for this talk, you might as well take this constant here to be zero. Don't, don't worry about what the constant means, so take it to be zero. And, uh, but uh, <laughs> then if you take the appropriate limit of this equation when c goes to zero, this will simplify. Uh, and, but anyway, the, 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 the theorem is that uh, if you want to solve this, solve this equation, you just find, take any analytic function Q of two variables, you write this equation Q of e to the minus cx, z, e to the minus cy, w equals zero, and you think of this as an implicit equation of, for z as a function of x and y. Here c is a constant, think of c as a very small constant, w is one minus z, so, so this, this is a, an equation for the complex variable z as a function of x and y. And every solution arises from something of this, of this form. Okay, so let's skip that part. Um, if you remember back at the back in the statement, if, if you don't mind, if I go back, right? There's this nice algebraic curve which gives you the boundary between the faceted regions, the frozen regions, and the interior where things are fluctuating, and. There's a kind of a uh, very, at the end of the day, very simple formulation of that of of how to uh, how to find that curve. In fact, it's almost the simplest curve that fits the desired has the desired properties. So, the Arctic boundary, it, you know, how do you get the Arctic boundary? We just take a, a family of lines parameterized by one variable t. So here, this here, this well, it looks complicated, but it's just a family of lines. Here's x times something plus y times something equals one. That's a line, and that something is a uh, depends on t, depends on one one extra real parameter t. So you can everything here is real, uh, and there's some constants a1, a2, a3, c1, c2, c3, b1, b2, b3. Uh, you write down this thing, and and what family of lines do you want? Well, you want the family of the, the simplest family of lines which contains all the boundary points in order. So you, the, 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 one of those, for a certain value of t, you get this line. For a certain for the next value of t, you get that line. And that line, you know, there's nine, nine lines here. And there are nine variables. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not so hard to figure out what the, the variables are. Of course, there's some... Uh, you know, Murphy's action in the background, but you don't have to. You can mod out by that. And once you've written down that family of equal, uh, family of lines, it's it's a pencil. Of, it's a family of lines which contains the boundary. And and if you look at all the other lines in that same family, they form the the the, the envelope of those lines form the Arctic curve. The, this curve, this nice curve, which separates the facets from the rest. Anyway, so if you like the algebraic. Geometry, some elementary algebraic geometry, that, that that makes a nice makes a nice picture. Okay, so now I can. So this was all 15 uh, years ago, uh, and 
that, all those calculations were based on determinantal methods, uh, linear algebra, souped up linear algebra. The, recently, we, we, uh, one, one of the goals of statistical mechanics in the 20th century is to study uh, other models, other random models, and the, one of the paradigmatic models, and one of the most important models is a six vertex model, which was, uh, you know, defined in the first half of the 20th century, and uh, first solved in, uh, in, in some case, a special case by Lieb, 67, so 50 years ago. Uh, so what is the model? Uh, well, the, in the simplest formulation, you just think about maps from Z2 to Z. So I'm, I'm taking all uh, maps, uh, you know, I'm associating an integer to every lattice point, and then adjacent lattice points should get adjacent integers. So, so they're, so they're graph maps from the graph Z2, this, the two-dimensional grid to the one-dimensional grid. Uh, and, uh, but uh, in the physics formulation, we're, we're going to put some more complicated measures on this family of maps. And locally, uh, so the six-vertex model, you can define it as uh, uh, orienting, orienting the edges of the grid so that at every vertex, uh, two arrows come in and two arrows go out. And there are six ways to do that locally at a vertex. And uh, so, and we associate to each local configuration a weight, A1 through A6. Now here's a typical configuration, right? We, we have some sort of boundary conditions, and then we want to fill it in with, with or oriented arrows, I mean arrows, so that at each vertex there's two coming in and two going out. And the, the weight of such a configuration is the product of the weights of its individual, individual vertices. So if there's, you know, 10 vertices of this type, it's going to get a weight, uh, well, which one is it? <laughs> A4 to the 10 uh, times the, you know, the product of all the other weights. This is also called the square ice model, if you know it in that ter terminology. Uh, and, uh, you know, Lieb uh, I I solved the case a particular subcase here where the, this is a so-called symmetric case where A1 equals A2, A3 equals A4, A5 equals A6. That's sort of a three-dimensional sub-variety of this six-dimensional space. Um, another I interesting sub-variety is this, quote, quote I mentioned, one sub-variety of weights where you can solve, again, by determinants, determinantal methods. But uh, uh, this is the sort of maximal sub-variety where these determinantal methods work, and, uh, and, and we're interested in going beyond that so-called free fermion point. Okay, and, and by the way, we're, we like the, this formulation better. It's, a, it's an equivalent formulation where you just erase the south and west going arrows, and, and then, uh, you know, this configuration is just an empty dot, and then the other configurations look like that. So it's a, it's a model of lattice paths sort of north and east going lattice paths, uh, which are allowed to touch each other, but not cross each other. So if they touch each other, you get a weight A2. So that's the six vertex model. And well, we, we you know, we, we don't know how to solve the full six, six vertex model. That's one of the, you know, big open questions. In, uh, but uh, we are interested in a particular five dimensional sub variety uh, of that the, which we which we call the five vertex model <laughs> in, a, in a striking lack of imagination but uh, so it's a it's a general it's a special case of the six vertex model uh, where we just disallow the, this particular configuration but the what we like about it is, 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 is a non-trivial generalization of the Lozenge tiling model, which I talked about up till now. Okay, so, so here uh, we have only five local configurations, and uh, I, I reparameterize the weights this way, one e to the x, e to the y, r, e to the x plus y over two for, for the last two. So the, those x and y are the same x and y as we saw in the Lozenge tiling model, uh, uh, you can think of x as giving you, uh, e to the x is a weight per vertical edge, e to the y is a weight per horizontal edge. 
and and there's but there's this one extra parameter r which counts which gives you a, a weight per corner. So a configuration, uh, here's, a, here's a typical configuration where x is 0, y is 0, and r equals 1 on some big torus. So you can see it's a, just a collection of monotone lattice paths. And uh, when r equals 1, uh, we, we just get the uniform configuration on all, on all lattice paths. Like all the weights are 1 here, non, non-intersecting lattice paths. So this is, again, a copy of the of the lozenge tiling model. What's the relation with the lozenge tiling model? Well, if you look at this picture again, and you just look at the green and blue paths, you can see if you sort of draw the, the, the well, each, each green and blue lattice path is, is a lattice path, and they don't intersect each other, and they're monotone. So the, the, there's an obvious sort of bijection between these models. So the difference between our model and the lozenge tiling model is that uh, well, when, well, when r equals 1, we do get the Lozenge tiling model. When r is not equal to 1, then uh, we get an extra weight per corner. Every time there's a blue and a green uh, Lozenge adjacent to each other, we get an extra factor of r. All right, so here, just, you know, here's some simulations. Here's r equals 1 again. If I increase r, if I make r very large, then each path wants to have lots of corners, so it wiggles back and forth uh, quite a bit. If I decrease r, then the paths don't like to have corners because corners uh, penalize your, your weight, and so the paths uh, like to go uh, straight for a long time. And, uh, well, you can't really tell from these simulations, but there's something interesting that happens if, when r is small and high density, and you have a high density of paths. You, you can see that the paths kind of uh, tend, to, tend to follow each other for long, long uh, t times before turning. So there's some sort of group behavior here that you don't see in these other models, these, these other parameter values. All right, and uh, just like in the laws and tiling model, the, the, these two variables, x and y, uh, control the slope, the local slope of the model. If I if I increase x, I'm going to increase the density of vertical paths, so, I, so my paths like to go vertical, and I'll have many vertically going paths. If I increase y, same thing happens for the horizontal paths. And so the, the just uh, the there's a but you know there's an interesting correspondence, just like in the lozenge tiling model, between the weights x and y, where the here here are the the logs of the weights x and y, and the slope, s and t. s and t is uh, playing the same role as before. It's, this, it's the slope of the average function, average height function. So, right, so for fixed r, I'm going to fix r and I'm going to vary x and y. X, varying x and y corresponds to varying the, the density of lines. Uh, you, uh, before it was the density of green and blue tiles. It's equivalently the density of li lines horizontally and vertically. And Finding the relationship between x, y, and s, and t is, is, in some sense, the goal, because the the quantity which we care about, the surface tension here, its its uh, its gradient with respect to s, s, and t is is in fact x and y. And if you like to write things in terms of the free energy, the gradient of the free energy is s and t. So once we know the relationship between x, y, and s, and t, we can integrate to get either of these quantities here, and uh, here's, here's the slide which tells you the analog of that geometric, the, the, of the triangle from before. And uh, we still have the same triangle, not, sort of not surprisingly. Here's the 0, 1, z triangle, right? But we've also got this, I'm fixing r, and here r is less than 1. r is another parameter. So, so 1 minus r squared lies somewhere between 0 and 1. And, uh, uh, let me, let's call the apex of the triangle z, just like before, and I'm going to draw a, I'm going to draw a circle uh, through 0, 1 minus r squared, and z, and it intersects the, and, and w bar is the other intersection of the circle with the line between z and 1, and then I, can, then I have these three angles, s theta is the, is the argument of z, t theta is the argument of that, well, it's that angle there, and 1 minus s minus t theta is that angle. I, and, 
And uh, what is theta? Well, I didn't tell you what theta is, but it follows from the other data. If, if, I, if I give you z, yeah, well, th this angle is s theta. That's 1 minus s theta. So this angle here is like pi minus theta. But, but really, um, oh yeah. <laughs> You're not supposed to know what z is ahead of time, right? You just hand me s and t, right? You give me the slope, and r, and and what is how do I how do I define z? Well, if you give me s and t, then I need to find z such that this the ratio of this angle to that angle to that angle is s to t to one minus s minus t, and that determines that that those ratios determine z exactly. I mean uniquely. Through some non-trivial uh, uh, trigonometry again, it's just elementary trigonometry. But uh, you know, I can't write you a function of z as a function of s and t, s and t because it's a, you have to invert some complicated trigonometric function. But okay, so once you you know you give me s, t, and r, I can find z. And from uh, once I found z, then x and y are this somewhat more complicated version. Uh, 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 versions of the logarithm. Before, there, before x was just the log of the edge length, now it's a, some more complicated function of z, and y is the anal analogous function for w bar. And, and b is this, also involves the dialogarithm, uh, but the, you know, it looks very similar to the block wigner dialogarithm from the other slide, but the arg and the log are interchanged. So it's some sort of dual, dual block wigner dialogarithm. I don't know. I, I don't know what this function should be called, but it's very important for this model. Oh, and by the way, uh, z and w, right, I haven't told you what, what w is. <laughs> I didn't tell you what it was before either, but it's been hanging around on the slides. And uh, oh, this is a mistake. Uh, this, this is supposed to be r squared times z times w. But anyway, there's, there's some uh, equation, algebraic equation relating z and w and r. Okay, well, uh, this was sort of the answer. I didn't tell you how we get the answer. And the, the answer uh, is obtained by really a, a very old technique in physics called the beta ansatz, which is everybody is slightly scared. All mathematicians are slightly scared of the beta ansatz because, you know, it's used to prove beautiful things, but uh, it's not completely rigorous. Uh, in most cases, and we, uh, but in, in our case, some, some, there's some simplification which allows you to actually uh, make a rigorous proof. Uh, what, what is the beta ansatz, by the way? Uh, it's just a diagonalization of the of a so-called transfer matrix. So what we're going to do is put the model on a on a cylinder. On so imagine, well, this is, I, I didn't draw it very well, but imagine it's, uh, that, that this, this, this edge is connected to that edge. So I'm going to have sort of periodic boundary conditions. And my paths are coming up from, from below and continuing above. And, and the transfer matrix tells you how to, tr how to uh, transfer the information from one row of, say, vertical bonds to the next row of vertical bonds. And if I, if I tell you that I have paths coming in at places 1, 5, and 6, and they go out at places 3, 5, and 7, then you can figure out what the weight of that configuration is. It's got, an two, it's got four corners, so it's got an R score, R to the fourth term. And so the matrix is indexed. This is a huge matrix indexed by all possible configurations of path in, incoming and, and outgoing. And the entry is going to be non-zero if there is a way to connect them uh, you know, using the rules, the allowed rules. And the goal is to find the leading eigenvector of this, the leading eigenvector of the transfer matrix determines the, the free energy. You know, if, if I, uh, you know, if I want to know, if I, if I take a, 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 the kth power of the transfer matrix, it tells me all the total weight of path from a given state at, at time zero to a, a particular state at time k. So in particular, if I want to count all possible paths, I need to take the trace of, of k or, or the sum of the entries of t to the k. So in particular, the growth rate, the prone Frobenius eigenvector, uh, eigenvalue of t uh, uh, determines the free energy, gives the free energy. And well, nice thing about this model, 
which is not true in all models, but uh, uh, it is here, is that the, it has a partial diagonalization into blocks, k, when you have, uh, where k corresponds to the number of particles. If you can either have, you can have zero particles or one particle or up to n particles if the, if the circumference here is n. And so the, the, there's this nice partial diagonalization and each of these individual matrices is just an n choose k by n choose k matrix. So slightly smaller, but still huge for a large k. And the beta ansatz, beta's uh, you know, great idea is that we can actually write down an explicit diagonalization of this matrix. So he uh, postulated that the eigenvectors for each of these matrices have a particular form. Uh, and let, let me just sort of go over this very quickly. Well, okay, let me just t help you out here. <laughs> if there's only one particle, then, you know, the, the matrix is just a circulant matrix. It has this circular symmetry, and the eigenvectors have to be of the form uh, zeta to the x, where zeta is an nth root of 1. n is a circumference again. So there's really nothing to do in that case. And uh, with some more work, for when you have two particles, you have a similar form for the eigenvectors, except it's a sum of two sort of exponential functions. Uh, uh, zeta 1 to the x1, zeta 2 to the x2, plus zeta 1 to the x2, zeta 2 to the x1. So, right? The difference between these two terms, uh, while well, they have different coefficients, and, but you just interchange the which uh, complex base goes with which coordinate. And uh, the general form is exactly the, the, the generalization of this. The, the, eigenvector, the eigenvectors all have this very surprisingly simple form, which is that there's there are some, uh, you know, if you want to evaluate the eigenvector when the particles are at positions x1 through xk, you, you form this sum over all the symmetric group of this sort of general Vandermond-like determinant of a Vandermond-like matrix. Only it's not really determinant because the coefficients here are not plus or minus one. They're not just given by the signature of the permutation. The coefficients are some more, more complicated function of the permutation. So I, so I wrote determinant, but it's a little determinant sub A, which is to remind you that uh, the A's are some f function on, this, on the symmetric, some non-trivial function on the symmetric group. But once you guess that the eigenvectors have this form, you can turn a certain crank and figure out what, what equations these zetas have to satisfy and the, and the a's. Uh, and the, this was all worked out uh, uh, many years ago, 50 years ago still. Uh, and in the general case of the six vertex model, the Sutherland, Yang, and Yang worked this out in, in the most general case. And this is not the most general case. This is already the I specialize to our situation where the where we're in the five vertex case, not the six vertex case. Okay, it still looks you, know, you have to the zetas here. This is an equation for the zetas, which are the, called the beta roots. They satisfy some system of polynomial equations, which looks like this, and it looks it still looks pretty messy. Uh, now the the but the rest of the analysis is massaging these equations into something we can understand. And the first thing to do is do a change of variables, so I'll define w to be this thing. And then the, the denominator here only depends on i, so I move that over. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now I can hear myself talk. Um, the equation boils down to this. The, you can think of the w's as the beta roots, right? And the equation is w to some power times 1 minus w to some power equals something. And this something is in fact, symmetric in all the other beta roots. There's, there's, there's n, little n of these beta roots. This thing is a symmetric function of all the roots, so let's just pretend like that's a constant, and then all the, all the beta roots have to satisfy the same polynomial, w to some power, one minus w to some power equals constant. And look, those, that polynomial is quite simple. We know where the roots lie. They rely on these nice curves called uh, Cassini ovals. What's a Cassini oval? It's kind of like an, an analog of an ellipse where instead of using the distance to the two points, you use the log of the distances to two points. So alpha times the log of the distance to zero plus beta times the log of the distance to one equals one. So that's the Cassini oval C alpha beta. 
and here you see a few Cassini ovals uh, for, this, for the same alpha and beta, but varying, varying the constant here. Oh, sorry, well, okay, I did it backwards, but <laughs> vary this constant, and uh, you know, when the constant is very small, you see that there's two ovals, there's sort of tw 12 roots here and four roots there for this particular case, and, but as the constant increases, at some point the ovals merge into two, into, into one oval. And, and so that, this, is, this interesting merging property is gonna be the source of an interesting phase transition in our model. Okay, but okay. So once we once we know what oval the curves lie on, it's fairly easy to then you know go back into the equations and solve for the leading eigenvalue. It looks complicated here, but it's really not so bad. And uh, there's the at the end of the day. It's not the end of the day yet. <laughs> uh, there's the. Equation for sigma. There, there's a formula for sigma. It's got some interesting behavior, which is that the, it's it's only piecewise analytic, and this uh, you know it's nice strictly convex here. I'm sorry, minus sigma. So it's actually, sigma is actually convex, and then but then there's this piece where it's actually linear, and that that phase transition corresponds to the the place where the ovals join up. All right, and skipping ahead. Uh, we can solve, we, we, there's some, the Euler-Lagrange equation is some PDE, which is again a single PDE for a single complex variable Z, and we can actually, again, solve it, not using characteristics, but using some other, I don't know what to say, there is a, there is a solution, and uh, here's, here, well, The, the solution has a has a kind of an interesting, very general form, which we also see in the uh, lawson tiling model, which is that, remember that that family of lines, something times x plus something times y equals zero. Here, there's this kind of a uh, similar flavor to the to the solution, to the to the to this equation, which is that there's uh, some some function of z, some function of w, but then the, the, the height function comes in. And here, f, here again, f, which I was calling capital Q before, is just an arbitrary analytic function. And you know, you can write down some explicit parameterization, which uh, which you can then integrate. And here's the uh, boxed plane partition limit shape. So, and I, I apologize to draw it. In, I sort of drew it in Cartesian coordinates, but the, and the level lines here are the level lines of the height function. So you can see. Uh, uh, it looks very similar to the previous case. Something interesting is happening near the corner here. I don't know if you can see, but there's a little gap there. And that gap uh, is a place where there's no limit shape, at least uh, as far as we understand. I mean, there's no, no theorem about what's going on there, but it's pretty clear from the simulations. Here's, here's some simulations that, that there's no limit shape in the, in the sense that the thing still fluctuates at, uh, in the scaling limit. So here's r equals 0.6. If I, if I decrease r, remember, as r gets smaller, the, the, the two ovals separate, uh, and uh, you know, near, the, near the corner, there's this region which, which looks random. You can see these large, large scale pieces, large scale steps, which are, which are random. And in fact, this, our, the, our theorem, our limit shape theorem only covers uh, what's going on in the di disordered region, you know, and th there's this nice arctic boundary here, and we can get the analytic solution inside, but we, but the outside, uh, our, our theorem doesn't cover that, that region, so, uh, and, and as R decreases, when R gets to about one third, that, that region just disappears completely, and this, and, and so I think the, the whole limit shape is random at that point. So I think I'm out of time, so I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So are there questions? So when, you, when there isn't a limit shape here, do you, is there any some sensible conjecture about how I might quantify, you said it, it, it's random, but, but in what sense? 
you still say something sort of interesting about? No, I can't say anything interesting. About <laughs> no, that's the right question, and we're, we're still asking ourselves uh, uh, what's, what's going on. Uh, it, uh, the, the recent uh, suggestion is that uh, if, we, if we add an extra boundary condition along the, along the l lower boundary and, and the upper boundary, see, see, we didn't put any boundary condition here, but if we, if we pretend like the, all the paths are supposed to, go, supposed to go down, then that would add an extra factor of r along this boundary, and this would push push this, this point uh, much farther down, and then I think that would uh, rigidify the situation considerably. But th this is just, uh, everything is conjectural about this. The reason is the, the surface tension is no longer strictly con <laughs> convex. So, so uh, as far as we know this, we, all we can get is a mixture of uh, Gibbs states. I mean, uh, the, we're not in an extremal situation of, uh, of having a unique Gibbs state, so we're still working on it. Any other question? Okay, so thank you very much, Richard, and thank you very much to all the speakers of this afternoon. Thank you.